Thank you for joining the webinar about the European market potential for TEF and Fonio. I would like to welcome everyone who's attending. Today's session, we will talk about the market potential for TEF and Fonio. I have a couple of things I would like to share with you before we starting. We cannot hear or see you. You're here as attendees in this webinar. If you have any audio problems, try the phone call or contact our colleagues in the chat box. In this webinar, we will have an interactive session and we also ask you to ask questions to our panelists. You can use the tab questions to ask any question to us. Of course, we will answer the most important ones to have really this interactive dialogue. We also have a couple of polls. Please fill in the polls. We're very curious to hear your answers, of course. So people that just joined, welcome to this webinar and I'm looking forward to really have this really engaging session. I now try to go to my to the agenda. All right, a couple of things I would like to share about the agenda. I will hand over to my colleague to give the introduction about CBI. Then we will have the first part about what makes Europe an interesting market for Fonio and TIF. Then we go to part two. What are trends that create opportunities and risks for the European Fonio and TEF markets? Then we will have questions and answers. And then we will talk more about the website of CBI. Arthur, may I ask you to introduce CBI and yourself? Yes, you may, um, Lauken. Thank you very much. So, good morning uh, to everybody. Uh, good afternoon, maybe in some places. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking all of you for joining us um, today. Also, I'd like to send out a very special welcome to the companies and the business support organizations from Guinea that participated in the CBI focus groups in February and March of this year. And uh, I'd also like to mention our local experts and European experts that collaborate with CBI, uh, both in our research and in our export uh, coaching programs. And lastly, a very warm welcome to all of you, exporters and importers, Def and Fonio that accepted our invitation to join us today. Uh, for people that do not know me, uh, my name is Arthur Scheinart, and I am uh, with CBI uh, for the last two and a half years as a program manager responsible for uh, CBI's market research, and one of my sectors is grains, pulses, and oil seeds. Um, so for the listeners that do not know CBI yet, uh, let me shortly uh, explain who we are and what we do. In a nutshell, uh, CBI stands for uh, Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. Uh, we are a Dutch government organization funded by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, as you can see in the slide I'm showing, sharing with you right now, it is our mission uh, to connect small and medium-sized enterprises like yourself to the European markets and to create sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Um, the way to do this uh, is export promotion. So what we do is that we help to find practical solutions to bottlenecks in the export value chain. And one such bottleneck is a lack of uh, good market information. And that brings me also to the goal of today's session. So um, in the coming months, we are uh, organizing a number of sessions on a number of agricultural products that we deem as high potential. These include Fonio and TEF, but we also have webinars on cashew and macadamia. So um, why do we do this? The main reason is a transfer of knowledge. So at CBI, we do a lot of research. We have a big uh, network of importers and we have many sector experts and consultants that uh, work for us um, um, and that do coaching for us um, uh, of SMEs, both in Africa and Asia uh, on a daily basis. So with these webinars, we ask them to share their best tips, and practical insights with you. So we really hope that today's webinar will give you new ideas, inspiration and that it will um, help you to prepare your business for your next export. So if you're new to exporting, 
uh, this webinar and the materials we share might be a first step towards exporting. And if you're already exporting, uh, the webinar and the talks by European importers might give you an extra perspective that can help you focus your business on a certain markets or on a certain segment. Um, on behalf of CBI, I wish you all a very good session. Back to you, Lau. Yeah, thank you so much, Arthur, for introducing CBI. Um, I would like now to go to introduce the panel. Um, and maybe first of all, I didn't introduce myself. So my name is Lauke Koopmans. I'm a sector account manager for CBI. Thank you. Um, I can already see that Nick Salter joined our session. Very much welcome, Nick. Um, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody from a cold but sunny UK. Um, my name's Nick Salter. Um, my, uh, my company is uh, called Aduna. Um, we are a, a UK business with a focus on creating demand for underutilized natural products from small scale producers in Africa. And we, we focus on what we call transformational foods. So those are foods that have a high commercial opportunity, but are also combined with a high potential for social impact and for environmental impact. And I'll talk a little bit more about ourselves later on. Thank you so much. Very keen to hear more. Then I would like to ask Michel Paperkamp. We are working a lot with you as a market intelligence expert. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Michel, you need to unmute yourself. My apologies. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so, yeah, my, my name is Michel Paperkamp. Uh, I work as an independent uh, export consultant, business developer, and market researcher. Um, I've been working with CBI together with CBI for the past uh, six years, more or less. Um, I've done some export coaching and I've done a lot of market research uh, with uh, CBI. Um, I specialize in uh, food ingredients um, and I'm really interested in uh, new ingredients uh, such as uh, super grains, uh, quinoa, chia, but also teff and, and phony, of course. Um, so I hope to uh, share a little bit of my uh, passion and my knowledge today uh, with, uh, with you. Thank you so much. Then I would like to ask Solange, could you introduce yourself and be very curious to hear more about Symphonio? Could you sure. also unmute yes. yourself, please? Yes. 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 Thank you for uh, giving us opportunity to uh, share our experience with you and with your uh, audiences. My name is Solange Dumay. I am co-founder of um, Symphonio. Symphonio project is, um, has been created especially to highlight the ancient grains, um, African heroes, what we, as, uh, how we call them. We like to uh, reintroduce, uh, reintroduce them in Europe and also uh, make it more popular locally. Uh, grains such as Symphonio has been completely forgotten in Africa. And so we really are keen to uh, contribute to their introduction, including with other grains or um, superfood as they call them today. So I will be sharing that uh, later on my uh, um, presentation. So for now, um, that's uh, what I've been talking about. So launch the mic, it's my name. Thank you so much. We're very curious to hear more from you. All right, then may I ask to close your webcams because with the exception of Michelle, because we will be starting about the first part of our webinar. And before we do this, I will ask a question to you in one of our polls. So I will launch the poll now and I'm very curious to hear your answer. Yeah, um, one second. About what do you currently export? So we'll give you a few minutes. So what do you export? Do you export? Yes, export to the EU. Do you export to neighboring countries or 
perhaps you're not exporting. And the question is really focused if you export Phonia or TEF. So I can see people answering. Excellent. I see a majority coming up with um, of voters. All right, I will close the poll. I can see that most of you voted. Um, very good. Um, so I can see that we, I would like to share, that we have 75% of you are not exporting any Phonio today. We have 18% of you who are exporting to the EU already. And we have 7%, yes, they're exporting Phonio or TEF to the neighboring countries. All right, Michel, this can be interesting for you to understand a bit who is already exporting, who is not exporting yet. So now we're very curious to hear from you. Um, yeah, what you can tell us more about the market potential. Yes, of course. Um, let me just uh, share my side of the presentation. Uh, if I have the rights, there we are. Presented. Thank you. So I will um, uh, you should be able to see there we go, uh, my presentation um, on TEF and Phonio. Um, well, as, as, as we saw, the majority of the participants, um, they do not have uh, exports yet. Um, and there's a, a smaller percentage that is already exporting. Um, but it's not, it's not a very strange uh, outcome, I think. Um, because if you talk about TEF and Phonio, both products are uh, quite new products for the European market. Um, and they have uh, both, um, both they, they, have, they have had some, uh, some, uh, um, some restrictions uh, or at least um, some things that slowed down their uh, development. Um, starting with uh, TEF, um, talking about uh, TEF, this is, um, this is a product that, that had been uh, patented uh, uh, some years ago. In 2003, um, a company managed to put a patent on TEF. So basically, um, this prevented the marketing of TEF, uh, mixing, uh, ripening of the flower, uh, uh, and, and uh, selling, selling the, the, the product on the European market. Um, so basically, you needed uh, permission of, of the patent holder. Um, and this patent had, be, had been applied for in the Netherlands, in the UK, Italy, Germany, Belgium, Austria, uh, uh, France, Spain, and even Turkey. Um, so all those countries um, had become more difficult for exporters to, um, to, sell, to sell TEF, um, and even for local companies. Um, but the patent was uh, controversial. Um, so there was a lawsuit in, uh, that started in 2014 uh, by a company um, that wanted to use TEF in one of the products, um, and they um, well they, they struggled for for at least four years until the patent was revoked, uh, and that was in the Netherlands. Um, so basically, uh, the judge said it's not a valid patent uh, it's not you you shouldn't be able to put a patent on uh, on a basic commodity such as that um, and this re repeated itself in uh, in germany with a law firm um, they also asked to uh, to revoke the the, the patent um, because there was basically a little legal basis for it 
um, so the patent holder, uh, they waive the patent rights as well in Germany. So the Netherlands and Germany uh, are open markets again for, for TEF or any, any company, uh, foreign company or, or local. Um, the expectation is that the same will happen in the other countries where the patent is officially still uh, holding up. Um, but I think it's 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 very good news um, because you can you can uh, um, you, you can you can see that there will be more potential for for TEF uh, uh, without without a patent. Um, so that was a, a bit of a restriction for TEF um, in in the last uh, basically in the last decade. Um, for Fonio, it's a little bit a different story. Fonio is even uh, much newer on the European market, and it's actually a novel food. Um, a novel food um, is uh, a foodstuff that has not been marketed in Europe uh, before 1997. Uh, so the novelty of the food means it's a novel food and means it usually has restrictions. Um, luckily for Fonio, there's enough proof that it is a traditional food. So it has been authorized uh, as a traditional food in the European market uh, without much restriction. So you can use it in any way you, uh, you, you like. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a good thing for Fonio. So it's uh, it's not not um, it, it was traded before in, in the past years, but now uh, since uh, 2018 2019 uh, it has become officially uh, allowed to be marketed as uh, a food product. Um, so these are these are conditions that will make it easier for these products. Uh, to be marketed in the, in the in Europe and the European Union. However, um, both products are still niche products, uh, and that's really important to uh, um, uh, to to understand. Um, just to show you a little bit of details on the market, uh, for TEF, there's no specific trade statistics, that's the downside. It's really hard to get a, a clear picture of, about the volumes. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I try to uh, to do this anyway. Um, and if you look at uh, smaller niche grains, uh, which include TEF, uh, but also, for example, Amaranth, um, you see a, a volume of uh, uh, up to six, 7,000 tons on annual basis. Um, a small part of that uh, can be categorized as TEF. So I try to look at the, the main uh, potential exporters of TEF at this moment and um, filtered the, uh, their uh, export data. Uh, and then it got reduced to uh, more or less a thousand tons of TEF that was imported into the European Union. Um, of course, this is, this is a, a rough estimate um, and it does not include uh, the TEF flour, it's only the grains. Um, and um, um, let me check. Um, and of course, it, 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 there is also a possibility that more TEF is important uh, under other uh, trade codes. So, um, actually, at the moment, there's um, there's a lot of TEF coming from within Europe as well. There are several um, farmers that, that are, are doing trials with TEF, uh, started to, to produce TEF, um, not because they're, they're much more competitive, but it's uh, it's more out of, uh, I would say, out of a, out of a passion uh, for, for the product. Um, and a lot of the local TEF is supplying the market at, uh, at the moment. Um, there is a preference for local products because it's seen as more sustainable, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's closer to home, uh, and it's better, better, to, better to control as well in, in production and cultivation. So there is a preference for local products. Uh, however, it's uh, such a niche product that it will not be likely that um, uh, that that Europe will, will supply all of the uh, future demands for TEF. So import will still be uh, possible. If you look at Fonio, um, 
the, the volumes are much, much, much smaller than than, than TEF or or any other grain at the moment. Um, if you if you look at uh, the data um, in 2019, there was less than 200 tons imports uh, officially, according to the trade data at least. So that's that's a tiny market. It's uh, it's, it's not even 20 containers of of product. Um, so this gives a, a bit of a, a bit of a view of of the size of the of the market. Uh, however, you can expect uh, TEF, uh, uh, sorry, Fonio to to increase further. Um, of course, it got approved uh, as a novel novel food. Uh, that was in, at the end of 2018, and you already see an increase in 2019. So let's let's hope that increase will uh, will definitely uh, continue. Um, but just be careful with this market because, as you see with a lot of products, new products, the market is easily oversupplied. Um, even when the demand is high and, and all of a sudden there may be a lot of demand for a new product such as Esfonio, um, the reality is, is that, that a lot of um, uh, producers and, uh, and exporters will flood the market with products. Um, basically killing the, the margin. So um, be aware of, of the market uh, market developments and um, um, well uh, adjust your expectations to the uh, to, to this to this growth. Um, to give you a few tips um, for this uh, this pioneering market, I will uh, I will focus on some of your questions uh, later because I see there are some questions coming in. Um, so basically in, this, in these types of markets, um, try to work together, um, definitely try to work together with, uh, with uh, companies in Europe. Uh, they're usually uh, pioneers, uh, uh, um, uh, small companies that are more specialized in these types of products. Um, and these are basically the best way to go, at least in the beginning. Um, because you really need a dedicated partner that, that knows how to market these, these kinds of, uh, of products. Um, but you can also uh, see for yourself the interest from the market by visiting trade fairs. And there are several trade fairs that specialize in uh, food, uh, food ingredients, um, but even the specialized uh, fairs such as the bakery fair in Germany uh, uh, and the Free Farm Expo in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, of course, the larger fairs would be uh, CL, uh, Anuga, uh, Biofag for, for organic. So, um, to continue to, to try to, to get a grip on the market. Um, this, is, uh, this, this is, I think, the best way to um, to make a rough estimation of the potential of TEF uh, and Fonio. Um, if you compare both products to other grains, you can compare it, for example, with, with millet, which is uh, a much larger product with 53,000 tons, uh, opposed to one, 195 tons for Fonio. So that's, that's a huge difference. But of course, um, a product like millet is the European, the European consumer and, and users are much more uh, familiar with millet, uh, and it's even uh, not only used in food, but also, for example, as, as a bird seed. Um, so it, it, it's hard to compare. Um, I think the best comparison would be with uh, products such as uh, quinoa. Um, uh, why, why do you think it's comparable with quinoa? Well, if you look at uh, food media, um, quinoa is often compared with uh, Fonio and uh, Tef. And Fonia, Fonia and Tefa are often presented as, as being the new quinoa because quinoa has had the success of, of market growth in, in Europe. Um, of course, quinoa is a, is a product that, that is not um, originally from Africa, it's from the Andean countries, Peru and Bolivia. Uh, but uh, it has a lot of similarities. So, they're all gluten-free uh, grains. Um, that's a similarity, but they also um, they also have, have, have an ancient history. 
uh, they have been produced for for many many uh, many years um, so you can see it as, as a really uh, original traditional product from these countries um, and even in, in, in nutrition, quinoa and teff um, have a bit more pro uh, protein than fonio, but for example, fonio is much richer in minerals. So the nutritional nutritional value of these grains um, uh, are often superior to to common common grains that we are used to in Europe. So that's that's a, that's a similarity, and that's an indication that that these products do have potential on the European market. Um, so the question is, why has quinoa been so successful and uh, Tef and, and uh, Fonio have not had the same success so far? Um, so what, what, are the, what are the differences? Um, and I think personally, um, I think if we talk about quinoa, it has been, um, uh, it has been promoted a lot. The product, um, it was for example, in 2013, uh, there was the year of the quinoa. Um, it got hyped in the, in the in the United States, and the United States is often a good market for new products and product promotion. Um, and uh, in Europe, it, it usually goes a bit a bit a bit slower, but you know, a lot of people look at look to the USA. Um, I think uh, they also managed to to uh, professionalize the production of quinoa. So in, uh, in the early days, there were a lot of smallholders, a lot of small farms, um, but they were joined in cooperatives. Uh, and later on, they were, followed, they were followed by professional growers. Um, so they were, able, they were also able to, uh, to extend their, uh, their production um, and make the production uh, suitable for the export market. Uh, so they did they did a really good job uh, uh, on that as well. Um, and if you look at Latin America, I would say their market access is usually uh, better. They're, they're usually better connected to the international market. So that's that's something to take into account when trying thank, to export. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, point. Michel. Maybe to um, because we get a lot of questions coming in, and and yeah. I also want to give the opportunity for people to ask maybe a few questions. Um, I will take yeah, two maybe, questions. Maybe it's good if you ask me the questions, if there's something, yes. uh, really yeah. something to, to address, so because maybe, for me it's a bit hard to, uh, to no, multitask. No, no, I will <laughs> ask the questions and then I will hand over to Aduna, because we're very curious to hear also more about um, the market side. So question is, is there an export ban for TEF? Uh, not, well, at least, at least not on the European side. Um, of course, there uh, there has been some restrictions from Ethiopia, but that's more uh, that's the, that concerns the, the government of Ethiopia because they they want to secure uh, uh, the avail availability of TEF on the local markets. Um, Thank you. I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure the situation at the at the moment, but that's something you should ask in your country. I think. Very good. So it's good to, to look at your own country if you have an export ban, but not in the EU. Maybe the second question is, um, are you aware, are other countries also exporting TEF? Uh, yes, there is some, um, there, there, there is TEF from other countries, um, but it's, 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 it's really hard to get the really exact uh, volumes, um, but there should be some TEF coming from South Africa. Uh, uh, I know Israel is working uh, with the products. Um, uh, even even the United States, I, I know they have been producing TEF, uh, although I'm not sure how much TEF they actually export to to Europe. It usually stays okay. in the, in the country. So yes, there are there are other countries, but if you look at production, uh, it's basically 99.9 percent it's it's from ethiopia um, uh, but the exports from ethiopia has been really small uh, so far at least according to uh, to the data we have excellent thank you so much michelle we will have more questions for you in the next part um i would like to continue with nick um nick Salter's presentation about Aduna. Nick, thank you very much. And Michel, could you close your webcam, please, so we can see both the PowerPoints we can see, Nick? Very good. 
Okay. Hello again, everybody. Can we, can yeah, we jump, Nick... to my, jump to my first slide whenever you're ready? Absolutely. Nick, we're very curious to hear about your interest in Phonia. What is the interest of consumers in Phonio and TEF? And what do you see as challenges for Phonio? Okay, good morning again, everybody. Um, just to give you a very quick introduction to Aduna, um, I mentioned earlier on we're, we're based in the UK. We've been around for about the past 10 years or so. Uh, there's three parts of the business. So um, firstly, we have a consumer brand. If you go onto the aduna.com website, you'll see lots of pretty photographs of um, products from Africa, and they tend to be sold mostly through high street retail chains um amazon and various different online channels um secondly uh, we have a bulk business which is a significant part of what we do which is where we are supplying um products by the ton or by the container into food manufacturers and food distributors and uh, ingredient distributors people such as that and then the third part to the to the business is that we are also a baobab fruit producer. So we've been working in northern Ghana since um, 2014. We also work in southern Burkina Faso, um, working with about 90 communities, around 2,600 women to um, export baobab fruit to the UK and then to be able to distribute it um, to other other businesses and to use it in our own products. So, so that's a very, very brief introduction to to us as a business but um, I'm principally here to talk about Fonio so if we can just jump to my next slide please um, Fonio is an ingredient which we launched onto the UK market in January at the beginning of this year um, and one of the first questions, I guess, is, well, why Fonio? Out of all the various different wonderful ingredients that Africa produces, did we, did we choose that? Why is it interesting? Um, why is it something that we should focus on? And there's a few reasons behind it. So to start off with, there is a pull for healthy alternatives, healthy ingredients. And that, that pull from the market has existed for, for quite a while now. But it isn't just any any ingredient. There, there is a significant realization, not just with consumers, but with the food industry as well, that um, we are going to need to move as a planet towards a more agro biodiverse environment. In other words, there needs to be more foods within our supply chain. It, it's a remarkable statistic, but over 75% of global food, this is the entire food for the whole world, 75% of that comes from just 12 plant species and five animals. That's not particularly biodiverse. And another great statistic is that as an entire planet, we get 60% of our calories from just three plants, rice, rice, maize and wheat. So this whole um, notion of diversifying our our, our foodstuffs, diversifying what we're growing and where we're growing it is becoming in increasingly important. And there are huge big businesses like Unilever, for example, who produced a report relatively recently about future future 50 foods, new foods coming to market that ought to be int introduced and we ought to try to get into our diet. And Fonio is right up at the front there. So at the outset, I would say that Fonio does have huge potential, but that has to be married with the fact that it also comes with quite a few challenges and we need to be able to be aware of those challenges to be able to realize that 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 potential well now one of the reasons that it has such a strong potential is because of its versatility it can be a staple alternative to a variety of other ingredients it's something that can be used um, within the home whether you're using it as a grain whether you're using it as a flour it's an ingredient that can be very easily used in food manufacturing as a substitute for a whole raft of other ingredients. It can be used within the food service industry. So these, these are catering companies or people that are producing foods in hospitals, um, prisons, restaurants, wherever. Um, 
and and it's one of these ingredients that is quick to cook it's easy to cook it's easy to access it's easily easy to experiment with you've also got the benefits that it is gluten free there is a huge movement um, in in western market or i might call it a movement but there is a um, a drive with the celiac community to be able to identify new foods that are gluten free it's rich in iron it's rich in amino acids it has a fantastic taste you don't necessarily associate taste perhaps so much with a grain, but there is an organization in the States, the Whole Grains Council, who did a, um, a review relatively recently with regards to all of the ancient grains. And I'm pleased to say that Fonio came number one in their list as the tastiest of the ancient grains. Um, and then last but not least, perhaps, is its overall potential to create impact, um, as I'm sure many of you um, who are calling in from Africa will know, Fonio thrives in poor um, soils. It, 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 it thrives in areas where a lot of other things don't necessarily grow or easily grow. It doesn't need a huge amount of nutrients in the soil, et cetera. And therefore it has huge potential, firstly, for on the social impact side, of if, you, if you can create an economy out of it, you're putting money into people's hands. And it has a huge potential on the environmental side, because if there's a demand for it, then it can be grown. That helps to stabilize the, the, the land that puts nitrogen back into the soils, etc. So the overall Fonio story with regards to its potential is, is I, I think, quite significant. And you've only really got to look at what has happened in the quinoa market over recent years to see how you can take a grain from relative obscurity into something which is a mainstream ingredient and, and, and generating you know, multi-million dollars um, all around the globe. And Fonio has only got to take a very small part of that to make a huge dent and have a huge impact in a, in, in a lot of different lives. So um, that is, that, that's an overview to the potential. If I can just jump on to my next slide, which is quite a busy one, and I'm not expecting you to have to take in or read all of that, but I want to talk very briefly about one of the most important facts in being able to make Fonio success, which is this balance between supply and demand. Because if you are on the Africa side, if you're on the producer side, then your interest is all about being able to produce a quality crop, find buyers and get it out to Western markets. Um, the only way, the only way that Fonio is going to be a success is by thinking about the full value chain. That means the producer, that means the exporter, that means the brand that buys it, that buys it, that means the distributor, that, that means the manufacturer, that means the retailer, that means the consumer. That is the chain. And it is a chain. And if any of those links are weak or broken, then it doesn't matter how fantastic your product is, what volumes you can produce, how great the quality. If those links aren't nice and stable and firm and secure, then um, it isn't going to happen. So the supply side and, and the demand side have to be working in, in parallel with one another. Um, and and our, our skill set, I guess, our focus is on that demand creation, is looking to identify how we can grow the awareness so that the supply side, the producer side, can, um, can, can properly function. And what I'm showing you here um, is a snapshot of a piece of work that we've been involved in with um, uh, a group known as FACT, which is an agrobiodiversity agro accelerator, which was put together by Google in the US. And what that's looking at is saying um, very sensibly, hold on, you've got, a, you've got a producer over here and you've got a potential buyer over here. How do you connect these two together? How do you combine these two worlds? Particularly if the buyer over here doesn't actually know what exists over here or how to connect into a producer and how does a big buyer talk um, constructively and effectively with a small producer and how does a small producer find a big buyer so rather than actually having a simple buyer seller relationship as you might do in, exi in, in existing foodstuffs where everybody knows exactly what's happening 
let's create a platform where we can put producers and potential buyers together to talk about these challenges to try to identify how best they can be solved and i'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on this particular slide but this is what this is really doing is illustrating an example this this particular this this actual example refers to a very large um, food service company in the US um, who made it their um, mission, who, who decided that what they wanted to do was in, in, in their multi-billion dollar supply chain to be able to introduce some of these future 50 foods, some of these um, new ingredients like Fonio. And what were the challenges that they might come up against in trying to get that kind of an ingredient into their supply chain. And when you look at a huge business like this, there's a whole variety of different ways that a producer can potentially um, supply into. So for example, if you just look at these little yellow blobs here, you'll see that a lot of these companies have a sustainability and corporate responsibility mission. So this can be a driver from within the business saying, we are a responsible company, we are a business that is wanting to look at sustainability, let's look at products that could create, that, that, that create impact in some shape or form. It could be down at the bottom, the marketing team who are saying, well, what we need is something different to our competitors. They're, they're producing a regular range of products that everybody's familiar with. Let's us produce something with Fonio that people don't know anything about and could get excited about. It could be up at the top there, the culinary team. So these are the people that develop new recipes that are responsible for new product development, that are looking to develop new concepts, etc. Or it could be the procurement people, the buyers who are just you know, looking for something that could substitute an existing ingredient at a, at a favorable price. So I show this slide purely to be able to get across this message that it isn't just about buyer and seller, it's really finding two teams that can work together to be able to, to, to find solutions. Thank you, Nick. We, it, it's very interesting to hear this. Um, actually, we get quite some questions in. I would love to ask you already before, let's go to, to the final slides. Um, so there's a, a bit more general question, like how can you be an actor in this business? I think you already uh, shared that there's different steps where you can actually interact. Maybe one is, are there also any possibilities to import packed end products from Africa? Or would you see it more as, as, as a commodity they can export? Mm. Okay. Um, first question, how, how does a small producer in Africa manage to reach buyers in the West? Um, at this early stage, I would say that the key single word is visibility. You have to give yourself visibility. You have to be able to be found. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, there is not an army of buyers out there desperate to buy Fonio, desperate to find producers that can produce Fonio for them. There are a number of businesses, an increasing number of business who, businesses who are starting to get interested in Fonio and in TEF, I should, I should say. Um, the key thing is, is that the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go on the internet and they're going to look for potential suppliers. Um, if they can't find you, you're not going to even start that conversation. So it, this is a big question with a whole range of various different answers and we could have a session specifically on how to find a buyer. But if I was just to drill it down into one word, it's that visibility. You have got to make yourself known in some shape or form probably through some sort of web presence so that people can find you and to, to start that dialogue in the first place. There's many questions coming in. Um, I would also be curious to hear, for instance, in, in Nigeria, they said they produce Fonio in bulk and large quantities. Would you still say, like, like you say, you need to have some added value versus this bulk and commodities? Um, Okay, so the, there were two questions. There was, there was one question earlier about finished products and, and, yes. and selling finished products into, into European markets. Um, that isn't the way that I would go. Um, fin finished products is hugely competitive. 
in, the, in, in, in Europe, it's heavily regulated. There is so much that you would need to know about, you know, labeling and packaging and rules and regulations and all the rest of it. And that's even before you've got your product on the shelf in comparison to everybody else's product. You've got nobody in the, West, in, in, in the Western market, presumably, that's actually pushing it for you or representing you or a salesperson on the ground. It's going to be a tough job unless you've got a lot of financial support and clout behind you. So personally, I would go the way of bulk. Um, the most important thing right now in Fonio, in bulk, if you want to differentiate yourself from any other producer, is to focus on quality, quality, quality. It is all about risk management as far as a buyer is concerned. And when they are looking for a product, they're not necessarily looking for the cheapest price. What they're looking for is the best quality product. And what most buyers will do is they will first of all say, okay, who is supplying Fonio? I've got a guy in Mali, I've got one in Nigeria, I've got one in Burkina and I've got two in Guinea. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take samples of all of those products, I'm gonna bring them back to my business, I'm gonna put them into the laboratory, I'm gonna analyze them, see them, test them, find out if I've got any grit in the grain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then based on those results, I'm then gonna make a decision on who I may wish to purchase from, and then we'll have a conversation about price. So if you want to be in the lead, you really have to focus, focus, focus on quality, because ultimately that's what's going to get you into the market. Very good, very good. Maybe the, the final question to you is actually the first question today. How can we actually, eh, like SMEs in West Africa, how can they connect with the buyers? How could, how could they get in touch? Is it trade fairs? Is it digitally? Like, how can they get in touch like like a Aduna, like you and others? It really is back to this question of visibility again. I mean, it's it's very easy to mention things like, you know, tra tra trade fairs and so on. But but trade fairs are not are not inexpensive. They need a lot of organization or you're going to need you're going to need a donor or you're going to need somebody that's going to be able to sponsor you, et cetera, et cetera. But you will find, you know, Fonio is out there with, as, as a potential crop that businesses are increasingly getting interested in. They will find you, but they will only find you if you are visible. So you've really got to think of those different ways as to how you can make yourself visible. I, I'll, I'm going to very, very quickly rattle through these two slides. Luke, I can do that in one minute. Very good, very good. Maybe yeah. uh, focus on the last slide and then I would like to go to the second part about trends and then we can have more question and answers also in the, in the final part to hear more about you. Can we just quickly zip back to that um, previous one? Yes, it will come. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about two quick, two things very, very quickly. And this is going back to what I was saying a second ago about linking in the demand and the supply side. So one of the things that we learned with Baobab very quickly is, is what we call the vicious cycle of obscurity. So there is no awareness in the market because there is no product development and there is no product development in the market because there is no awareness. And what we have to do is to be able to break that cycle and identify a way of being able to bring the products to, to, to consumers' minds so that they understand what is there. And then the second thing, if we can quickly jump onto the next slide, is to avoid what we call the chasm. And you see that little baobab fruit there, which was an example that, that we were using when we were um, looking to, to, to develop the, the, the market for baobab, is it's very easy for us to be able to get excited about the potential of an ingredient to think, how can we get it into that, that, into that majority to be able to create that massive market? But it really is a case of understanding that there is a life cycle in these products and it has to be a continual focus of being able to push Fonio into the market on a constant basis to get it past that chasm, as we call it, of early adopters and into the mainstream. So it's a product that we see not just in small scale groceries, but also in you know, lar large supermarkets and being used by the large multinationals as a, as, as a core ingredient. And if we can get it past that chasm, then we have a huge potential product on our hands. Thank you so much. Very interesting, I think, this, uh, this product life cycle. Um, love to see it for Fonio and Tef as well in the future. Curious where we're going. Yes. I would like to go to the, to the second part of this session where we will talk about trends. Um, if you could close your webcam, please, Nick, then we, um, we will see you later in the Q&A session. Sure, will do. Thank you. 
And we will start with a little poll again, where we're very curious to hear more about you. And I would have the second question to you is, which trends um, Europeans find the most important? So is this natural, healthy, organic, gluten-free or authentic? So what do you think what the Europeans are thinking is most important? So I already get some answers in. I can see most of you already voted. Very glad. Excellent. A few more people. Is it natural? What people in Europe find important, healthy, organic? Very curious eh, when we hear more about Symphonio. Gluten free or authentic? Great, I will close the poll for now and I can tell you that we have a winner about uh, what this small group is thinking, but 47% is indicated they find healthy most important. Then we have 21% of Europeans find natural most important and gluten-free at 21% as well. So thanks for, for very much sharing these interesting insights. And I think this can uh, provides Michelle with some good answers about, okay, what are actually the trends that are so important looking at the data? Michelle. Yes, um, Lauke, okay. thank you. Um, yeah, let me just get the, get the screen back. Uh, yes. There we go. Okay. So yes, um, actually, I don't think there was a there was a wrong answer in that um, um, because they 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 all have some truth to the to the trends, um, but we can uh, try to uh, quantify them a little bit more. Um, let's let's start with a general overview. Of course, um, healthy and natural products. Um, are increasing in interest with uh, European consumers. Uh, so we talk about nutritious food, uh, no chemicals, uh, prefer preferably organic. Um, and you see a lot of these these uh, typical super grains uh, being marketed as as an organic uh, and natural uh, product. Um, so that this this might provide uh, some opportunities as well for smaller farmers that are that are um, maybe better capable to to grow uh, an, an organic product. Um, but we also talk about uh, free from uh, free from will uh, indicates all products that are free from certain allergens, um, uh, gluten free. Um, uh, so we, we we're looking we're looking for uh, less bad things or more more good things. Um, and the third of it is uh, authentic. Um, I think both Tef and Sfonio, they are considered ancient grains. Uh, they have a long cultural uh, history, heritage. Um, and that's something that, um, um, that, 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 is, that is something that, that interests uh, European consumers as well. So basically, you know, we want to discover the old goodness of a traditional food. Um, and in that sense, Stefan Fonio, of course, have an enormous uh, potential to be promoted as uh, authentic and ancient grains. Um, so let's start with organic. Uh, sorry, let's start with free from. Um, uh, so Europe, it's, it's, it's one of the front runners in uh, free from foods. Uh, UK and Italy are leading countries. Um, and we're talking about more or less uh, one percent of all consumers in Europe that have celiac disease, which means that they really uh, cannot eat gluten, um, and they are on special diet. So these are ingredients that are very suitable for that group. And one percent is not much, but um, of course uh, uh, there's a much bigger group of people that are, are sen sensitive for gluten. Um, um, uh, and uh, maybe family members uh, of someone with celiac disease, and they all avoid 
gluten just you know to be safe um uh, and they you know they, they realize that gluten is not uh, not that healthy uh, in the first place so there's a lot a, a lot a bigger group that avoid gluten as um as a whole and of course there's a group of people that are focused on health and they also uh, are attracted to uh, gluten-free uh, products um, talking about organic, um, I'm going to speed up a little bit the presentation because I heard I don't have that much time. Um, so organic, uh, this is uh, a market that uh, keeps on growing in Europe. You can expect it to uh, to grow with, with, with similar growth figures uh, up to uh, 2030, so at least another decade. Um, last year or the year before, 2018, it was 2.5%. And a half, two, uh, seven and a half um, and it's um, it basically addresses a large number of European cons consumers uh, for different reasons. Um, organic is, is considered healthier, it's considered safer, uh, and it's considered to be better for the environment. So there are a lot of reasons to choose uh, organic. Um, uh, and pesticides, avoiding pesticides is basically your main goal. Um, in, uh, in, in selling your organic products. Um, let's see a few examples in the, uh, let's start with Fonio. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to stress that Fonio and Tef are quite similar. So all the things um, uh, you will hear about Fonio is probably true for Tef as well. Um, looking, at, looking at Fonio, uh, we see of course the, the product of Aduna, uh, our uh, colleague uh, in this in this uh, webinar, um, who presents it as a super ancient grain, uh, natural, organic, uh, like I said, that's basically linked linked to the trends. But you can also see um, uh, uh, Fonio being being uh, marketed as as more as an ethnic product, like the first example, um, which is a typical company that that is specialized in. Um, in, in products, uh, in traditional products um, uh, from from other countries, and, and not not as much for, uh, in Europe, um, and even product development. Um, so you see the the the, the second picture um, with, with with the type of uh, uh, vegan burger, uh, but also pasta, uh, which is made in Italy by the company Oba. Um, pasta made of Fonio. So there, there are some some developments uh, with, the, with the product. And the same, I would say, is true for uh, for TEF. Um, uh, it can be marketed uh, more as, as, as a bulk product, but you can also, also find it in, uh, in breakfast cereals um, and even uh, sport nutrition. So the last picture is, is really uh, focused on the uh, on, on the on the sport nutrition. Um, I think we have another question in, yes, in between. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, I will open the, the final poll for today. Um, bear with me. Um, so it will be the third question in. So which country has most potential for your product? Is this France, UK, Germany, Scandinavia, or Eastern Europe? Very curious to hear your answer. I can see already some people who voted. So which country has most potential for your products? And then of course, we're curious to hear from you, Michel, what the figures are already telling us about uh, the consumer preferences in those countries. So a few people, please, to vote, to get more people voting. Great, I will close the poll and share the answers with you. Um, we have France, no, I'm sorry, UK as biggest one is 43%. Then we have Germany, 32%, France, 14%, Scandinavia, 7%, and Eastern Europe, 4%. So 
So Misha, very curious to hear from your part. Is UK the biggest potential or is it France or Germany? Uh, sorry, I, th I think it's good news for Nick. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, 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 let's have a look. It's, uh, I can only give you an indication because these products are such so small that you know it's uh, it's it's really hard to to uh, um, to say upfront you know this is your market. Um, but if you look at the figures for niche grains, which uh, also include TEF, but is not only TEF, um, then we see the Netherlands and Germany as the the biggest markets. Um, so basically, the Netherlands you can you can consider as as a country that a lot of uh, commodities uh, pass the Netherlands uh, and are distributed to other countries. So it's it's, it's also lo as, a, as a logistical hub. It will be an important and uh, remain an important uh, market. Uh, but the market size, of course, Germany is much uh, bigger, uh, uh, with bigger potential for for TEF. Um, most other European countries, except for the UK, seem to be a bit behind. Um, but you have to understand it's uh, it's still uh, a very early market for TEF and even more for Fonio um, because for Fonio really try to to gather all data from 2012 to 2019 um, and then you see France actually being the biggest importer uh, according to trade data but it's only 755 tons in the past seven years so that's uh, it's not much, uh, but it's um, it's an indication that France is, uh, is adopting some of the, the some of the Fonio. Um, it's a company called uh, called Gaia, uh, which uh, which has Fonio products. Uh, in Italy, we have a company Oba, um, and of course we have our participants in this webinar from the Netherlands and the UK um, that are probably responsible for some of these uh, these these figures as well. Um, so it's it's a it's a really small market, but it just it gives you a rough a rough indication. Um, I think it's maybe more interesting to to look at certain trends and how they uh, evolve in different countries. Um, because if you look at, for example, the organic retail sales value, then you see Germany uh, and followed by France. These are important uh, uh, markets for for organic. Um, if you zoom in a little bit more, you can see, of course, Germany has the biggest uh, uh, retail value, sales value uh, with almost 11 billion euros. Uh, France has the highest growth, uh, at least uh, measured in 2018. Um, but uh, if you look at the consumption uh, per capita, uh, then uh, Switzerland and Denmark are quite high up as well. So Scandinavia is a really good region for organic as well. Um, uh, in Denmark, uh, it has, Denmark has the highest share of organic sales, which is 11.5%, so much higher than most countries. And the expenditure um, is more or less equal in Denmark uh, and Switzerland per capita, which is 312 euros uh, on an annual basis. So this gives you a little bit of an indication of the organic market. Um, if you look at gluten-free, unfortunately, there's not much uh, recent data, um, but this will definitely give some kind, some type of indication. Um, so the United Kingdom uh, and Italy, they're quite high up in the in, in their market size for gluten-free products. Um, there are actually uh, policies um, in these countries that that help. Um, uh, um, people with celiac disease uh, help subsidize uh, gluten-free uh, products, so that can be a, another incentive um, for for consumers to uh, to purchase gluten-free. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the the sales per capita, uh, so the the what what people spend on a personal basis, uh, then uh, Finland and, and Norway. Uh, are quite high up as well. Uh, so their gluten-free is also quite popular in the Nordics. Um, this is all rough indications, but um, to stay in a rough indication, I would say if you focus on Europe, uh, try to focus at least initially uh, on this part of the market. So north, northwestern part, 
uh, of Europe, uh, those will, this will be probably the region that uh, uh, that will be early um, adopters of uh, of Fonio and uh, and TEF. Um, thank you so, Michel. Michel, so thank you so much. Um, we get quite some questions in. Um, I would like to ask to you is uh, do some people are a bit worried whether Europe will become a big competitor in growing TEF and Fonio. Do you have any yes. ideas about volumes? Uh, volumes is hard to say. Um, uh, I know there's a, there's, a, there's a company that, that works with, uh, with European farmers, uh, TEF farmers. Um, so I know there's production, uh, but they they don't they don't want to, they don't want to share their the numbers. Um, but that, I think yes, it will be it will it will compete with the import of TEF. Um, but I don't think you should be too worried about it because if if you look at other products such as quinoa, quinoa is produced in the Netherlands, in France, in Spain, uh, in Germany, in the UK. Um, and that used to be a product that came uh, only from uh, Bolivia and Peru and a little bit of Ecuador. Um, but now we're producing it ourselves in Europe. Um, but it's only a, a small fraction of the total market. Um, the biggest percentage is still supplied by those Indian countries. Um, and that, I think the same um, will probably happen with, with, with TEF. I, don't, I, I think there will be more development of TEF production in Europe. But if the market uh, develops positively, um, I don't think Europe will produce enough to su supply the whole market. Okay. Um, so I, I wouldn't be too worried about it, but just keep keep an eye on the market and how it develops. Great. No, thank for you. Fonio, by the way, I, I haven't seen any production in, in Europe yet, and it's a question if it's if it's uh, if it's feasible, of course. Yeah, and that brings me also to a more production question. I don't know if you can answer the questions. If you are aware, are there harvesting equipment um, already for Fonio and TEF available? Uh, I've heard there has been some developments in, in equipment, um, um, and, uh, at, at least at least for TEF. Of course, TEF and Fonio are really small grains, so they're quite mm -hmm. complicated to uh, to cultivate. And that will probably be one of the main obstacles also in Europe because um, that there's a lot of manual labor involved and Europe will not be competitive in manual labor. Mm -hmm. um, I know there, are, there, there, there have been some developments with, uh, with machinery, uh, but I don't have the details on it. But um, I think there, are, there have been a couple of NGOs working uh, together with, with um, uh, farmers in Ethiopia on, on that matter. Um, okay. So it's good to uh, it's good to, to get into depth uh, on that. Yeah, yeah. So we get quite some questions in. I also want to save some questions for the end. Maybe as a summary, um, will there be enough Fonio for the African market uh, for the market if this really export is really booming? So that is, I think is already answered to your side. So uh, like the moment there is, let's say, a big demand. Do you think there's enough supply from West Africa or from Africa? Uh, there is supply, uh, both uh, for TEF and Fonio. Um, it is already produced uh, on, on, on a significant scale. Um, but then the question is, how much will stay in, in, in the countries and how much will be uh, exported? Um, I think on one side, you have to make sure that you have enough yourself. Um, uh, and on the other side, I, I, I think it can be expanded as well um, in, in most country, countries. So, yeah, I think there, will, there can be enough. You just have to make sure that you don't oversupply the market. And that's, that's what usually uh, or almost always happens when uh, a product uh, suddenly has a big growth in Europe. Um, so be aware of, of, of oversupply uh, rather than, than undersupply. Good. Thank you so much. And we're keen to hear more from you in the final part. I would like to continue to the last presentation. It's about Symphonio, Solange. Can I introduce you and then give you the floor? Thank you, Luca. 
Um, um, Misha, if you could close your webcam, please, and Mike, then uh, with all ears to Solange. Solange, please go ahead and share more about uh, Symfonio. All right. Thank you. So um, Symfonio has been created specific specifically to um, promote African crops, authentic crops. And so we don't want to really uh, just promote it as we have been talking about earlier in the panel. It is not only um, exporting, producing, exporting. We really want to focus on creating uh, food security for the local farmers, for the producers themselves. And so after they have secured their own uh, food, then we, we, um, we can export the, the excess for the market, for, for, for Europe. So we do that by um, helping uh, the farmers to produce better, to, um, to increase their yield so that they can have enough um, food for themselves in the first place. So can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So as I was saying, we are focusing on traditional crops that have stood the test of time, crops that have uh, contributed to the livelihood of African population in the past. And so, um, for instance, when you see the case of Fonio, it has been produced for over five, five years, but it has been totally forgotten. Even in Africa, not that many people know about it. Even me, I rediscovered it recently, a few years ago. So we want to reintroduce it by uh, producing it organically, uh, by uh, really investing in the, in the local community. And because of the benefit, uh, many benefits of Symphonio, um, um, we believe that by uh, investing in Fonio, we will be able to contribute in uh, the environment and also on food security. And uh, we also really focus on the women cooperatives uh, so that we can really do something better and leave a better world for our future generation. So that's the, the, the basically, uh, um, how you say, um, the aim of Symphonio. So why we choose it to, to uh, import only organic fonio? Now it is easy. Uh, my partners and co-founders of Symphonio have been involved in organic trading and importing organic food in Europe for over 40 years. Most of them have been um, involved with the import of uh, quinoa in the past. So they have learned a lot of what could go, go wrong. As a few of you have mentioned earlier, um, it has been so, uh, um, how to say, not organized that uh, at a point, at, at some point, uh, quinoa was even uh, not um, available anymore for the local uh, farmers. So we really want to avoid that. And so we really focus on uh, organic, but also sustainable production. So the choice for importing organic is like, is normal. It's actually organic is our religion, if I may say that. Um, so we really invest in farmers. We are not will, uh, looking forward to just buy and sell. We are really not interested in that. What we do is really creating a partnership with the local farmers, mainly women cooperatives, and then we help them with the resources needed to produce in a manner that we can really uh, make a difference in our, um, in our uh, food production. Can I have the next? Slides, yes. So um, the potential market, 
One thing we want to tackle with uh, the phonio, as I said, uh, my partners have learned um, how it went wrong with quinoa. So we don't want to have a product that is overpriced in Europe. When you look at the shelves in the supermarket shelves today, uh, phonio costs about more than 20 euro the kilo. This is, is not normal. With this price, we will never reach um, the, the phonio, phonio will not reach its, its full potential on the market. It is too expensive. It should be just a normal food like every other crop, even like quinoa. It should be able to stand next to the quinoa and have the same price. So um, in order to achieve that, we need to sell it and um, we need to reach a bigger audience. We need to... Um, to not only have this small uh, amount of, of sales, we need to, to target the mass market. So for now, the price that the, consum the consumer has to pay is too high. So with this trend, it will not be able to reach its full potential. The market to go to for now, in our opinion, is the baking or uh, baking industry for many reasons. Um, baking industry will buy an, a big amount and bulk um, for the bread. As we said earlier, um, there are many people that are allergic to uh, gluten and uh, not that many uh, wheats are, are, are available to, to, uh, to bake bread or bakeries or, or patisserie. So uh, the bakery industry will be uh, a, a place to go if you're look, really looking for to have um, a, a bigger market, at least to have a mass uh, distribution channel. And then you have uh, retailers. Um, in our case, we are now working with the retailers, a group of retailers that have um, more than 80 stores in the Netherlands and across the borders. So those are for us um, a channel that you can easily uh, put a lot of product at once on the market. And they are also interesting uh, retailers are interesting because they will also be able to invest in the communication that we need to establish with the consumers. At this okay. point, most of the consumers or most of the European people don't even know how to pronounce phonio. When you say phonio and then you ask about five minutes later and they're like, mm, what, did, what was the name again? So um, it is not known yet, and there is a way to go, a long way to go, for us to make it uh, popular around the, um, among the, the consumers. And then we have the typical organic consumers that are still. Uh, Tola, maybe before yeah? you you continue, we we get some very interesting questions for you actually. Um, okay. You talk about. A uh, different range of, of products. You talked about bakery products. Do you also see other opportunities for maybe cereal spaghettis made from phonio or teff? Sure, sure. Uh, I do see it. Uh, but yet we still have to communicate around that. Um, the, but the easiest industry for me at this point are bakers because we already are talking with them and they are doing tests and it, it is looking good but i really do believe that when uh, the time will go on that we can definitely make chips i even saw uh phone chips on the market already but it is only one company that's doing that mm -hmm. uh, cereal is absolutely a place to go you can consume fonio just like a breakfast normal in the morning you don't even need to make a special grain for cereal for, for breakfast or cereal okay. so. great and then second question is about you spoke about uh, organic um, is it a prerequisite to have an organic certification in place yes um i was going to come uh, on that on my next 
uh, slide, but I can answer that. Um, I do know that um, having an organic certification can be complicated for African producers, but yet it is something that can be easily achieved. Uh, there are many organizations, uh, I think in each country, in African country, you have a special, a special uh, department at the Ministry of Agriculture that help producers to organize themselves as cooperatives. And that's the way to go. When you are a cooperative, you are more powerful, um, you, can, you can have more support, and you are not doing all everything by yourself. And you can also talk about it with your potential partner, potential buyer. You can put it on the table for uh, for uh, for the financing if if that is the problem. But um, the certification of uh, FONIA is not that complicated because yep. FONIA is already by nature uh, organic. I do understand that if you need to produce more, then you need to invest an, an extra uh, resources to, to, to expand the production capacity. And that can include also some treatments, but yet it is achievable. All right. Well, wonderful. Then you also actually answered another question. Is Ponio not naturally organic? It is. Yes. Yeah. But you need the certification. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, thank you so much. Maybe if you could maybe share still in one minute the final slides, and then I still have a one good question for you as well. Okay, okay. So um, I was going to uh, my uh, two last points here are the consumers. Organic consumers are more and more, um, uh, how we say, in big numbers. They are really increasing, uh, especially now. Even the governments are encouraging people to to eat healthy food and to live healthy. So the number of organic consumer will only increase with the time. And what we see now is that they are really uh, demanding healthy food and they don't only want to eat organic food, but superfoods and food that has, uh, how we say, they have, you have this uh, functional food, uh, this fancy name, functional food, that provide you all the nutrition that you need and is good for the environment and is good for everyone involved in the uh, processing uh, channel. So the organic consumers are really a group that we need to pay attention to and also approach them and the way that they will understand what phonio is and also discover it. And then, um, at, yeah. Okay. Uh, restaurants. Yeah, wrap up, because then we still have um, the questions as well. Okay. So restaurants are also uh, um, uh, potential uh, buyers, but those are the groups that we need to approach them in a different way. They are not that many, uh, but I'm sure they will come. Great. Okay. And then maybe to launch the question I got as well. Um, mm -hmm. What it would be your advice? Yeah, like there's some people that are owning a brand. What would be your advice to set up? We call a, a responsible farming program. And I think that's the slide that you're showing right now. That you give some tips indeed how to set up such a program. Um, in order to do that, you really need to have uh, support from uh, from a professional. Um, professional institution that can help you set up uh, such a, um, a, a group, cooperatives mainly. Um, there are NGOs that can assist in doing so. Um, can, would you please repeat again your question? <laughs> I was so my curious. question is, if, if you want to set up a program, a sustainability program, what do you need yes. to do? So I can see cooperatives, you need to work with governmental institutions, work yes. with NGOs. Yes. 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 Mainly, yes. That's what you need to do. You really have to uh, to um, to apply it on the whole chain, uh, meaning that you are taking care of uh, the land, of the people are working with you, and the, on your processing uh, way, the, the whole chain need to be uh, sustainable. 
and you don't have to do it alone. There are so many NGOs uh, available over everywhere. I think even uh, uh, CVI work with um, uh, PUM, this, this is an organization from Netherlands that can also help doing, uh, helping you with the organization. Um, so let me go through my uh, a, a few last points here. Um, exporting um, function of, I mean, uh, exporting normal food, um, conventional food to Europe, is already challenging for uh, African companies. But exporting organic food is even more challenging. Why? Because you really need to apply for several documents and, and um, know the rules before you can start exporting as organic. If you are already doing so, I really have to congratulate you because it is, it is a hard way. It is, a, it is not an easy thing to do when you are starting. So important things that you have to, or important uh, tools that you have to uh, know or get access to are traces, uh, rats, and uh, also another certification is called uh, COI, in French is COE, uh, Certificate of Inspection. That one is like the masterpiece you need to provide to uh, your exporter. I mean, you have to make sure you have this one uh, delivered by the certification organization uh, in order to uh, clear your product in Europe as organic. Otherwise, even if you have went through all this travel, once your product has arrived in Europe, without the COE, uh, the, the buyer would not be able to sell it as an organic product. So this is something you really need to pay attention to it. And then um, the quality. Uh, it has been already mentioned a few times, but the, the quality of Fonio is uh, another thing very challenging to, to achieve. Um, especially the sand, the amount of sand and the Fonio. There is nothing um, more, how you say, um, unpleasant than biting on the sand when you are eating or enjoying your Fonio. So please try your best to eliminate as much as you can possibly eliminate scent on your phone, your production. Thank you so much, Solange. That's, uh, that's really wonderful. Then, yeah. Um, no, yeah, big thank you because you really shared more about uh, how it's possible to really source organic phonio. And I think you mentioned a good point. Quality is always very, very important as, um, as a start. Um, I would like to ask the different panelists to, um, to come on screen because I would like to ask each of you one question we received and I must say there, there's a lot of interesting questions coming and also comments for instance about um, Kees Jan mentioned there is a harvest and shelling equipment available in Mali and we got an interesting comment as well there's a company in London already packaging and distributing and demand is high and they had to stop actually taking orders from individuals so this gives some hope there is interest, um, a lot of interest in, um, in Fonio and TEF. Um, maybe a question I would like to ask as well to, um, to Nick, to you. Um, there is some, um, like to start basically a, a sustainability program has some costs, like cost for certification, cost for actually setting up such a program. And you still want to have, let's say, a competitive price compared to quinoa, rice and other crops. Like, what would be your advice about the whole pricing and, and finding investments? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I think as Solange was mentioning a second ago, uh, I think we, we have to acknowledge it. It is difficult if you are, if you can have access to Fonio and access to growers, um, but you still need to have the infrastructure and the knowledge as to how to actually go, go about exporting. And sometimes if you don't have access to that, 
the simplest way, if at all possible, is to find um, a partner that could be a commercial partner or that could be a donor partner or that could be an organization like CBI, for example, to be able to hold your hand and help and to be able to advise on, on what's required and the process to be able to go to, to go about it. So it's, there's there's many different routes, but but um, with these um, with these underutilized crops which don't have a lot of initial pull and demand to them, you really do. It's a lot easier to be able to work in conjunction with somebody on the buy side as well as the supply side as more of a partnership, as more of a, as a team working together to find a solution rather than attempting to to go it on your own unless you've got the, the the cash to be able to do that which of course a lot of people don't necessarily have yeah. thank you so much um misha maybe a question for you um do you know if the co2 sequestration is an issue for both grains you're you're, you're unmuted you need to unmute yourself misha Sorry, uh, the, 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 I was reading the questions and I saw the question, but it, I think it's more an agricultural question than a, than a market uh, question. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to say. In, in, in general, I would say it's always important to, uh, to use crop rotation. Um, and I would say with the, with the limited knowledge I have uh, in agriculture, that TEF and FONIO would be would probably be suitable to to rotate with a lot of pulse crops um fixing uh, nitrogen in the in the in the soil um but yeah crop rotation is also is always uh is always key and and, and for any for any product i would say but thank you so much. in detail it's uh, hard to uh, answer the question mm -hmm. maybe another opportunity if we set up a program to really work on um, on, on the goods agricultural practices um another question maybe for for um michelle about TIF. the regulation in ethiopia does not allow to export in a raw form so is there a way that can still add value or export it as ready to eat food uh, it's not allowed to export as, 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 a, as a grain as a whole grain you mean exactly yeah as a raw form yeah uh yeah the, the, the ethiopia sometimes has some some limitations in the export um which is a shame because it's the largest producer of TEF worldwide um uh, i already answered one of the questions which was a question if you if you can export in jira uh, like the TEF pancakes um, mm -hmm. and i know there's a company uh, uh mama fresh um, that is exporting in Jira, uh, also to Europe, I believe. Um, but of course, it's it's a it's a quite different market. It's really focused on the ethnic market, so in Ethiopian restaurants, uh, uh, traditional consumers of the product. Um, and I think most potential is probably uh, for TEF uh, in in new products, in uh, new uses. Um, so you can so you you can address. Uh, um uh, the the conventional consumer in europe as well um so yeah if you cannot export the, the grain that is definitely a limitation for for your country um yeah. then i would say try to export the flour um if you can find uh, interesting parties but a lot of times in europe they they want to do the processing themselves uh, because they, they 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 have control over the, the processing um, and there's a lot of experience with, with milling, of course. So uh, try to lobby as well in your country if, if it's not allowed or if it's not allowed sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Maybe Nick, final question for you is, um, how can we make sure that West Africa is not get bypassed in export production the moment Fonio becomes a success? Great, <coughs> great question. Um, I don't think that's going to happen, um, and I don't think that's going to happen for three reasons. Uh, the the first is that Ponio is a dry lands crop. It, it likes the dry lands of West Africa. It likes a poor soil. Um, it likes a nutrient depleted soil, 
which in so many ways is, is one of its huge benefits is that it will grow in soils and climates that other crops won't, won't grow. So that's the first disincentive. Um, the, the second is that Fonio is a fairly labor intensive crop. Um, one of the things that, that's very common to Fonio is it is, it is a, a crop which um, is, succumbs to lodging. Uh, lodging is when the crop actually falls over in the field. So it's a very light crop. It can, have, it can bend a lot, particularly after a heavy rain. Um, and that makes it quite difficult for mechanization. So it's not like we, where, you, where you have combine harvesters of wheat, which can just sweep across the field and harvest very easily, and one man can do it in a machine. Um, with Fonio, it's, it's, as I say, it's fairly labor intensive, um, and, and labor is expensive in European markets. And then I think the third reason is purely from an ethical perspective, I think there would be an outcry if that were to happen, because I think this is a big opportunity for a lot of the um, underdeveloped, underprivileged regions of West Africa, and to be able to take that opportunity away, I think would be a, you know, it, it would be a crime. I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be allowed. So for all those reasons, um, to my mind, I think Fonio will stay firmly in West Africa and could certainly become a primary export of the future. Interesting. Good. Then the final question for you, Solange, is um, there's a lot of SMEs who would love to reach out to European retailers, to traders who can maybe co-pack. But, but how can they reach actually the retailers and others? But what would be your suggestion? Um, as Nick has mentioned earlier, um, you need to make yourself visible. That's the first thing to, to start with. Sometimes you don't even have to build like a expensive website. Even a Facebook page will do. And once you have that, you have to have your things together, your information together. You can reach out to a customer uh, or potential customer, but then um, you have to be able to send samples to provide technical information about your product, to, to give like everything that the, a potential buyer needs to make this decision and also to show that you are serious and you know what you're doing and what you're talking about it. I'm receiving sometimes a lot of um, uh, emails from uh, companies of, of SMEs from Africa and they say, uh, we are a small cooperative, we can, we can uh, uh, supply shea butter, we can supply this and that and that. And then the one thing that I can say is you are not professional. You are small and you want to supply all this. You don't have the capacity. You don't have the the um, you don't have the I mean the um, the volume to supply. So first, have your things together. Know your product. Know pro make uh, a data sheet for for your products and then share it with the customer at least to show that you are serious and that you want to to uh, to, to respond to the demands and make yourself um, professional by providing the right information that will get the confirmation that will get the conversation going mm -hmm. that's great advice love it yeah i really would love to thank yeah the three of you for well first of all sharing all your really interesting insights and answering all the questions we got quite a lot more questions um, for everyone we will make a write-up um, but first of all, big thanks to you, and um, we're very looking forward to hear more from you. And we will share more, of course, about our next steps, what we're aiming to do for Fonio and TEF within CBI. So thank you, and um, wish you a great afternoon. Thank you. Then I would like to go to thank the you. final part of this presentation. I will hand over to my colleague, Arthur, who will share more about what you can find on our website. So. Arthur, over to you. We go over Thank you. This. Thank you, Lauke. You can uh, can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> yes, I think it's the next slide in your presentation. Um, if you could put that up for one second, um, it is still thinking. So, but let let me start just already by um, the slide will come up. So uh, I'll try to do it uh, by heart. Arthur, uh, do you see it? Yes. 
Do you see I, the slide? I don't, uh, I don't see it yet. No. So, but uh, to continue, um, uh, we have almost reached the end of this webinar, and there we have the slide. Thank you, Lauke. Before I give the word back to Lauke one more time uh, to close the session, I'd like to take a minute to highlight our online platform. Uh, see, uh, the URL is on top of the page, cbi.eu slash market information, and you will see that for your sector, uh, grains and pulses and oil seeds, we have about 20 market studies. These studies can roughly be um, categorized in three big chunks. We have studies that are about the sector, so what are the trends in grains and pulses? Very important. Huh? Uh, where can you find uh, buyers? That's a favorite one of everyone. Uh, and we also have studies um, with tips, specific tips from importers for exporters. We do a lot of interviews um, and we like to communicate that information from the importers to our uh, target group, to you, the exporters. And lastly, we have a number of studies on promising export products, and among those are Podio and TEF. Um, I want to uh, show you quickly uh, via our website. Um, and let me do that for you right now. And then I'll take you to the CBR website. So I hope that it's visible to everyone. I think so, yes. So this is CBI website. Um, if you go on the website, you go to market information. You see we have 14 sectors. Then very conveniently, the first one is grains, pulse, and oil seeds. Let me click on that. So this is the CBI website. Um, so what I was mentioning on the left-hand side, we have studies about the sector. Below that, we have tips from importers to exporters. We have some news. Uh, also, do not forget to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, the newsletter will uh, give you an alert each time we uh, upload new content. Uh, that can be news, but it can be a study. And lastly, uh, we have the market studies. Fonio and TEF, all market studies uh, about promising export products have the same structure. Let me uh, quickly show you Fonio. So for Fonio, we have two studies. The first one is a market potential, which is roughly aligned with what we've been showing you today. Next week, uh, in the next session, we'll be talking about the market entry. And the market entry concerns all of those questions that many of you have been asking today as well, um, about the requirements, about the legal requirements, about competitors, uh, about prices for Fonio and TEF. Um, today, uh, as you see, We've talked about what makes Europe interesting. We've talked about the trends. We've talked about European countries that import or might in the future import Fonio and TEF. Um, what more can I tell you? Uh, studies are very convenient. You can use them both on your mobile and on the web. By using the contents of this page, you can qu quickly click through the section. So if you're just interested in a small section, make use of this part. Um, if after today there's any questions, you can also ask us your question by using the question button. And that's about it. Uh, before I hand uh, back the word to Lauke, um, yeah, on behalf of CB CBI and myself and the Market Intelligence Team, thank you very much uh, for joining us today and I hope to see you next week. Back to you, Lauke. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Um, so I would like to thank all of you that participated actively in this webinar and we received many questions as i shared we all of you will be receiving the the powerpoint of the different actors um and as arthur said we're very much looking forward that you're joining us entering the market with tef and fonio so we will have even more in-depth discussions some of your questions we will take to that session as well uh, before you leave the session, please fill in the survey because that's very important for uh, to understand your feedback as well. Um, and as well for any other suggestions, we're very open um, to hear more from you. So wish you a great afternoon and um, we will be in touch.